Coaster Hop, President of the University of Washington Alumni Association. Welcome to the 2008 Engineering Lecture Series and tonight's presentation, Beyond Oil, Powering the Future. This evening's lecture is particularly timely as it continues to be a hotly debated topic on the national scene, especially in this election. And unless you've been immune from the media or you missed uh, the infomercial last night which featured uh, a couple of UW graduates who run a company called McKinstry, um, you've heard, likely heard quite a bit about our national oil dependency and a variety of ideas of how we should power our future. Tonight we'll learn why oil is so hard to replace as an energy source. We'll also hear in depth about emerging technology to convert plant matter to transportation biofuel developed by one of our Northwest companies, Warehouser. Tonight, Miles Drake, Senior Vice President for Research and Development and Chief Technology Officer of Warehouser, will give you the in-depth story about engineering the conversion of plant matter. Joining him for our presentation is our own Daniel Schwartz, the Boeing Sutter Professor of Chemical Engineering and Associate Dean for Research. So with that, gentlemen, thank you and thank you for coming. Thank you very much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And it's quite an honor, and I thank all of you for coming out this evening. It's an honor for me to be uh, here tonight, uh, providing some of the context, I think, for the whole story. So let's get started. I think you all know there's a lot of things that are on our minds, both for America and for the world, ranging from global climate change to the economic impact of changing oil and resources, fossil fuels in general, as well as security. These are things that I think most of us, in fact, I'd like to see a, hand, a show of hands. How many of you see one thing up there that you think is one of the top issues challenging our nation? Okay, when I look out, I see a lot of hands. Uh, how many of you uh, think that you see at least two items that you'd put among the top items that are challenging our nation? I still see a lot of hands. Well, how many of you share with me uh, the notion that there are probably three items up there that are really major challenges? Sorry to make you do this, but, uh, uh, well, I agree. And, and the question is, of course, energy is behind all three of those in some ways. So why exactly does energy seem to touch everything? Well, part of the reason is that it is simply huge. I did a bit of a digging around to try to find things that I thought would be comparable as, as man-made products. So what you're looking at is worldwide production in kilograms. The 10 to the 12 means there's 12 zeros after that number, so that's a trillion. If you look at steel, we're down in the few trillion kilograms. Cement, three, four trillion kilograms. Fossil fuels, when you add coal, which is the black bar, and oil, which is the more gray bar, and natural gas, the lighter bar, we have over 10 trillion kilograms of this stuff uh, that is being produced worldwide. And I couldn't find anything bigger than that, except for the one with the question marks on there. What do you think, what worldwide production are we making that might be bigger than fossil fuels? I heard water. Carbon dioxide from burning that fuel. When you put that 100 pounds of gasoline, which is about what you put in when you fill up your tank, when the oxygens are combined with it, you get about 300 pounds of, of carbon dioxide that's emitted out of your tailpipe. So every fill up, that's about 300 pounds worth of carbon dioxide. So it's huge. Now, I also think there are some other reasons, and I'm slightly slightly um, attached, I think, to the human energy advertising campaign of Chevron. That's because I'm a professor, and the, the theme of this is really about developing our innovation, the people and the innovation, that really it is not necessarily about just more resources. It's about developing innovation, creating a, a climate for innovation. And I call this sort of the Thomas Friedman, the New York Times uh, columnist, op-ed piece person. This is the Thomas Friedman advertising campaign. It's about creating human innovation uh, rather than simply relying on the time, time tried and true uh, natural resources that we've typically used, fossil fuels. And there's more to it than just that. You can look at the numbers. Human energy 
literally is not enough. If you look at the global human diet, my estimates of the energy content, there's a 10 to the 18th in joules, so that's a very big number. Global human diet is roughly 20 in those units. Uh, so that's all the food that we eat, all the calories we take in converted into joules. Fossil fuels are many, many, many fold bigger than that. All of the human energy literally in the world can't enable us uh, to do many of the things that we take for granted uh, in our life. Despite the fact that I ride my bike here, I know that I can't go visit my parents easily on my bicycle uh, down in all of the far-flung places that they live. So fossil fuels really extend our capabilities uh, in ways that make, uh, that make a lot of the life that we know possible. So replacing these fossil energy resources, it's going to be challenging. And I think we have to get over the notion that there is a universal solution. If somebody tells you there's a universal solution uh, to replace all this, they're probably uh, not thinking about it straight. It's going to take a combination of resources from solar, wind, biomass, nuclear, waves, tides. There's a lot of resources out there, but they're not as compact and, and usable as what we have been, uh, well, that we've gotten addicted to because it is so easy to work with. And it's going to take a combination of these things in the, depending upon the application. We're seeing cars now that combine batteries and gasoline engines in hybrid vehicles, and that combination helps. Uh, there's a lot of other ways that we can do that, but we have to be creative and we have to think uh, outside of our traditional modes. Much of the, we must use much of the existing infrastructure. We have a lot of sunken environmental investment in our current infrastructure. If we tear it all out and have to replace it to put in a new kind of infrastructure, it's not only costly, but it's, but it's wasting resources. So we want to really do that. Uh, we need to improve, improve energy storage. Many of the alternatives that I've listed up there are intermittent. They rise and they fall. You can't, when the demand is high, you can't necessarily throw more coal on the fire. Uh, and so we need solutions for storing energy. Uh, batteries are part of it, but there are many other uh, issues. Finally, I think we need this human energy and the, the sort of patient funding that can create a new generation of engineers and scientists to tackle these. These are not two-year problems. They're, they're long generational problems that we need to be working on. So I've put in yellow some of the things that we'll be talking more about uh, tonight. So let's get some uh, idea of transportation. Why is that so hard? And what I show on the left is the US energy sources. These are primary sources, oil, coal, natural gas, nuclear, renewables. And what I show on the right is how we consume them in the United States. Transportation takes about 29% of our energy. Almost all of it, 95, 96% of it, comes out of a barrel of oil. You can see the tiny little brackets under renewables and under natural gas. Uh, and those tiny little brackets make up the remainder of it. Uh, but transportation is largely driven uh, by oil. The remaining uh, sectors of the economy that consume uh, the rest of our energy are distributed from all of those sources, largely because those primary energy sources can be converted into electricity and then used in many ways. So we use uh, a lot of those resources in the form of electricity for residential, commercial, and industrial applications. Transportation is harder to do that for. Uh, and here's the reason why. If we look at, at a car and the kind of lifestyle that we're used to with vehicles, the gasoline tank is roughly the size that I show there relative in proportion to the car I show on the right-hand side. If we use ethanol, another liquid transportation fuel, it's got less energy in it. The gas tank to go 300 miles would have to be about one and a half times bigger. Okay? Or, uh, alternatively, if we were using the same gasoline-sized tank, maybe on pure ethanol we could go about 200 miles instead of 300 miles. Uh, Biodiesel would fall somewhere between there. Many of the other green gasolines that people are talking about fall in that range. If we look at some of the alternatives, the gas tanks get a lot bigger. I don't know whether any of you have taken one of the um, CIDA airport taxis. Many of them are natural gas powered. I took one back a week or two ago. And you can only put one big bag in their trunk because most of the trunk 
is taken up with a compressed uh, natural gas cylinder. So that's what CNG stands for, compressed natural gas. And if it's compressed at about 3,000 pounds, which my taxi driver told me was what he gets on a bad day, if there's a lot of people pumping from the station, 3,600 is typical uh, on a good day, it, the gas tank has to be about four times as big to go the 300 miles that a typical car would want to go. Uh, hydrogen, if you run it at 5,000 pounds per square inch, is about 10 times the, the size. So now we're talking about a hydrogen tank that not just takes most of my, uh, pass, or of my um, trunk space, but is also starting to encroach a little bit on my uh, passenger space as well. Finally, unfortunately, when we look at the best lithium batteries that are out there from the American Battery Consortium, which is a big, major uh, US effort to try and create better batteries, the energy density of those is just not high enough to re be a, a replacement. Now, when combined with some of these other alternatives, batteries can provide just the right kind of power for certain applications. And we, can, we know from hybrid vehicles, by combining again and doing some more sophisticated engineering, we can get twice the mileage in a, in a vehicle that has a hybrid power source than in just a single one. But the advanced lithium batteries, you can see at 30 times the volume of a gasoline tank, pretty much the car is a vehicle for taking the battery if it wants to go 300 miles. And so the Chevy Volt that is being worked on so feverishly by GM, uh, they are trying like the Dickens to go 40 miles on a charge before they have to change. But you can see from this that the current batteries are taking you, if it was the same volume as a gas tank, would take you about 10 miles. Uh, and so there's a lot of challenges uh, in in this realm, but things can be combined, things can be uh, made much more efficient. Uh, and I would also add that the hydrogen numbers that I have here are for if we burn it. You can burn hydrogen just like you can burn compressed natural gas. If you put it into a fuel cell, you double the efficiency. Now, now the volume goes down. If you increase the, the compression to 10,000 pounds per square inch, you decrease the volume a little bit. And so there are things you can do, but it's still very challenging, and compressing gases to high pressures takes energy. So, all right, so the talks are called Inspired by Nature. So the question is, where did this fuel that we're having such a, a challenge replacing, how was it made? Well, it was made from biomass, from algae and other plant matter that, that settled in the oceans, that settled on the land, got covered up, heat from the earth, warmed it. They had high pressures, low oxygen pressure because it was all buried. All of these things with time, and lots of time, converted it from biomass, this highly oxygenated molecule that is not such high energy density, to the fuels that we uh, are familiar with. If it was a little hotter, it might have been natural gas. If it was a little cooler, it might have been coal, different mixes of biomass made those things up. But biomass was and is the existence proof that you can convert plant matter into, into fuels. Uh, I must also add, uh, up there I have photosynthesis. Of course, this is all just conversion of sunlight into something. The sun is the primary energy source here in the sense that photosynthesis, we're consuming the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in the water and we're combining it with sun and uh, photosynthetic pathways to create that biomass. All right, the problem is we have to do better than nature. Nature gave us this great fuel, but we can't wait eons. Moreover, we have biomass supplies that aren't accumulated over eons. We need, if we want to grow it, convert it, and use it, we can't be building it up over years and years and years and then spend it all at once like we are doing now. We need to have a balance between the supply of the biomass and how much we utilize. So there was a Department of Energy and USDA study suggesting that there was about a trillion kilograms of sustainably harvestable biomass, not changing anything, not adding any roads to the forest, not changing any of our farm practices, any of our, uh, any of our practices really other than collecting mostly agricultural and forest uh, residues that are now oftentimes literally burned or left to rot and convert into CO2 anyway. Uh, it's enough 
uh, to supply about a third of the U.S. liquid fuels, it was estimated. And as I said, it's mostly ag and forestry waste, not food is what they were talking about. The other thing to add is that one of the reasons we have to do better than nature is that there is no free heat out there. Heat is energy, and of course, if we're doing this in an industrial process, we have to get that energy from somewhere. Uh, and so that means we're going to consume part of our resource making that heat. Uh, moreover, controlled pressure happens in a vessel, uh, and so we're, that's going to be a fabricated structure. We have to, in order to get around these barriers, we have to have some clever high temperature processing expertise, the kind of stuff that chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, others, uh, many of you in the audience uh, do very well, which is figuring out neat designs that are environmentally uh, and economically uh, sensible. Also, we need to uh, be exploring, and, and the world is exploring, low temperature, not high temperature processes, like biochemical conversion. We all know fermentation works, and the question is, can we get the sugars from the biomass uh, materials? And Miles will talk more about those sort, sort of subjects. Finally, of course, we can't wait, wait eons. Any one of these topics up here could be a whole talk, and so I'm not going to go in at this point uh, other than to say that the University of Washington uh, is a place that's working on those. Whether it's the biomass supplies, uh, folks in the College of Forest Resources uh, are working on forest-based agriculture and other um, forest practices that are sustainable. The Department of Biology recently had an algae spin-out company, Axi, uh, and this, this company is trying to commercialize algae as a, as a high-productivity biomass uh, resource for producing lipids and other um, valuable oils. If we look at the no-free heat, we do have a lot of expertise from chemical engineers, material scientists, mechanical engineers, as well as folks in the College of Forest Resources uh, and in microbiology working on biochemical as well as thermal processes to do these conversions. Again, you'll hear a little bit more about in detail from uh, Miles about advances. Uh, finally, we can't wait eons, and that means we need clever catalysis. In the Department of Chemistry, there's a major National Science Foundation center called Center for Enabling New Technologies Through Catalysis. Catalysis is about speeding up chemistry. Uh, there's also great work going on in the Department of Biochemistry, Chemical Engineering, uh, as well as others that maybe I've forgotten, and I apologize uh, if I did, that uh, are doing this to help us do better uh, than nature in, in this regard. Finally, human energy. Uh, this is a program uh, at the University of Washington that is trying to create this new kind of human energy, the kind that can balance uh, community resources and, and development needs with some of the resource management issues, molecular processing, science and technology, and systems design by putting together teams, interdisciplinary teams of engineers, forest resources, natural resources people, all the way around that circle of different needs uh, to try and have balanced societal impact, environmental impact, and economic impact. We're doing this in collaboration with some of the Native American communities in the Pacific Northwest who have specific energy resources and needs for their communities, and we're trying to, again, work with specific uh, groups of folks to try and address specific community needs in this way that we, we balance different resources that are available with different community needs. Uh, this program is going to train about 30 new uh, energy PhD students in, in the University of Washington alone. Uh, PhD student, to go from beginning to end, costs about $200,000. So this is a major, major resource in engineering to su support them with the research, the, um, the research, the stipend so that they can afford to do the work, the laboratory space, uh, this is all resource that goes into this team effort uh, to create that. They're five-year programs, typically, and that's the patient funding part that I was talking about, is that the, the one life cycle for a student, from uh, a PhD student entering to leaving, is about five years. It's not a, the problem is not a two-year problem. The solution is not a two-year problem. It's a generational thing, something that I hope that we can start addressing uh, in, in the form of uh, resources, ideas, 
and the people that can help my children and uh, the rest of yours uh, have a great future that is sustainable and balances some of society's needs. Now with that, I'm gonna make a transition uh, and ask Miles to come up and he's going to talk about many of the things that are happening around this wheel. Good job. Well, thanks, Dan. I do believe I've got a story here that really builds on what Dan says and illustrates how it's science and technological innovation, which has got to be coupled with the right business models and, and business innovation to can actually lead to opportunities for clean, secure, sustainable energy and materials using US human and natural resources. And Dan set the scene very well, and I think uh, it's very clear that solving these problems is going to be a, uh, a multi-pronged approach. There is no one magic bullet, and I'm not coming here with a magic bullet that uh, biomass solves everything. I'm coming here really with a, an approach which I believe is one element of uh, the future solution. Essentially, we've been going through a major transformation in the past, past few years. You may have heard about some of the uh, big changes in our business. And now, really, warehouses focused on uh, our forest resources. We, we have positioned ourselves as uh, owners and managers of high-yield, sustainable forests from which we can harvest and use a, a sustainable resource. Things like wood for home building, uh, pulp for a wide range of products, and actually, locally, you may have seen we've got a number of businesses uh, around the nation in home building. Locally, it's uh, qu Quadrant Homes. Now, in the U.S., Warehouser has become unique, actually, in terms of the uh, breadth of our manufacturing, our research, and our research capability in, in general. And, the, and the, this belie I believe this positions us to play an increasing role in bringing energy and sustainable materials solutions to the world. And I want to talk about some of the challenges in doing this. This is not easy. Whatever you hear with uh, little news briefs, uh, this is a tough challenge, and uh, we're working on it. And I'd like to sort of talk about these challenges and show how we're looking at creating, essentially, a, a new leg for the business, a future part of our business based around this big uh, uh, opportunity and challenge. So I talked about challenges. What are the major challenges of converting biomass to fuel? And uh, Dan illustrated this is one possible uh, solution. And these key challenges really are about will solutions that we come up with be truly sustainable? And that's on a seed to fuel tank basis with the public, with the technical community, with non government organizations and the legislator all understanding the case so that this becomes in, in a way societally sustainable. Can we reach a scale that makes a significant difference? Can we achieve a cost of production that will drive investment to scale? It's no good if we've got solutions that really are uh, way beyond the, 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 the present uh, affordability levels. And then can we enable the full supply chain from the seed to the fuel tank, it's a huge set of things that have to go on between creating a biomass and delivering a fuel into a tank. How can we enable the whole of that uh, um, uh, supply chain? So I'll touch on how we're gonna need sciences of forestry, chemistry, chemical engineering, and business skills to bring this to life. It really is a very diverse set of human energy that needs to be applied to, to bring this together. So now I'd like to just sort of talk about how the, start with how the forest complex has a chance to provide a piece of the solution that we're talking about for safe, secure, and clean energy. So what do I mean by the forest complex? Well, it's more than trees. It's the whole system of plants, biomass, soil, water, air, and sunlight that produces this host of rich, chemistry and materials through photosynthesis. The forest complex can produce outputs, which we all know through trees and plants that grow below and between the trees, shrubs, grasses, and other plant materials that make up the entire forest system. And in addition, there's eco-benefits. There's things such as water purification 
and there's carbon capture. All of these are part of the uh, total societal value and opportunities for creating value from a forest complex. And it actually offers a low input system which is sustainable to convert sunlight into materials which have wide uses as large and small structural components. So wood for houses, cellulose fibers for a whole host of products. Now, all the materials I'm talking about, all these materials, are not just structural materials. They actually are storing energy from sunlight inherently in terms of their chemistry. And that could be released later and used, transported and released and used in, the, in all sorts of ways. So you can create pellets that can be used for home heating and for power generation. Or you can go through processing to make ethanol or biodiesel for transportation fuels. So it's a very significant and uh, uh, diverse sort of resource. So what I'm saying is think of biomass, and Dan touched on this, think of biomass as a way to store solar energy in a material form. And in the case of living biomass, it's storing energy in a, in a form that can be renewed constantly. So photosynthesis is the key process from which plants lock up sunlight in the form of sh sugars. Now the sugars, in turn, can be combined in the plant to make cellulose, and the plant actually makes a whole set of other materials. For example, it makes lignin, uh, from the Latin to bind, that glues the plant or tree together, and hence you get the term lignocellulosics, which I'll, I'll use a little later. And for sustainable bi biomass use, we need to replenish the biomass as fast as we're going to use it, otherwise it won't be sustainable. In other words, you've got to grow as much as you're consuming. So you've now got to have a whole system which grows biomass, converts it, uses it, and at the same time is growing the same amount again. It's, a, it's got to be completely sustainable. What I'm showing here is the huge exchange of carbon, which is shown on the left here, between the atmosphere and water, and between the atmosphere and the biomass on the land. And you'll see that that, that exchange comes out to be something like 200 billion tons of matter going in and out. The picture also illustrates that when you look at this natural system here on the left, that in actual fact there's as much being emitted as absorbed. The whole thing is in, in more or less close to equilibrium and emits as much CO2 as, as it absorbs. And if you look at studies of a, uh, a, a, a long-lived forest starting from scratch and growing to be a, a, an ancient forest, then over the order of 100 years or so, the forest stops to sequester carbon dioxide or, uh, in, into it, and it starts to just become imbalanced. It, it, it creates a load of biomass, and then it, it essentially stops because as much is coming off as it's being, being grown. Now on the right, we show the other side of it, which is sort of the, the human, human driven emission of carbon uh, into, the, into the system th through the air. And that adds up to about 25 billion tons of uh, new carbon uh, per year. Now the grand challenge is to put all of this system back into equilibrium. And that is the really big challenge that, that Dan posed at the start. And that means you've got to either look at the right side, you've got to decrease emissions on the right, you've got to reduce the amount that's uh, coming out, which essentially comes down to uh, taking less out of that fossil fuel pot and burning it and putting it into the air. You've got to reduce this by uh, efficiency means and uh, uh, being more intelligent use of this or just simply using less. Or you can work as well on this side and can you increase the rate that we're uh, actually sequestering uh, carbon through the natural system? Or can you use this in some way to displace some of the fossil fuels so that you can still sustain your quality of life? In fact, this is pretty important that if you think about the world today, there's a billions of people who want to improve their quality of life, and the simple solution is to do more of the uh, oil going up into the oil and coal up into the air. It's not sustainable in any sense. We've got to find ways that you can actually have a sustainable, growing quality of life, and at the same time balance this, this whole system. So I want to step down a, a notch to look at the uh, from the total biosphere 
to look at present day forest resources. And what I show here is a, is a comparison. It's like, rather like Dan's comparison. And I want to give you an impression of the scale of the global forest resource today. And today, the world extracts about, as you can see, 4.6 billion cubic meters of oil. If you convert that to a volume, it's more than a cubic mile of oil. It comes out every year from the ground of uh, oil. And as Dan points out, that's then converted to things which end up as a huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the air. Now, for comparison, the worldwide harvest of wood is 3.4 billion cubic meters today. It's a huge volume of wood is, is harvested today. And that's almost a cubic mile of uh, wood as well. And compare those with the cement you see, plastic, steel, aluminum. These are relatively small volumes compared to the streams that are going through oil and, and actually through wood. So if you look today, our society really does rely on wood as a sustainable material for enhancing the quality of life. And just let's look at how wood is actually used today. And I remember, I'm using wood as an example of something that you can get out of, out of biomass that's done today. So if you look, look on the left there, half the wood is for industrial purposes, which is largely used on a sustainable basis. And in North America, it's really all done on a, on a completely sustainable basis. And it finds its use in wood for construction. That's a lot of it goes into construction of homes. And then it, it's extracted from the wood. You extract cellulose as a sort of pure pulp material, which then goes into paper, tissues, and products like diapers and even textiles. So that's the left-hand side. Very little is wasted of the industrial uh, harvest. Saw residues for making saw lumber are uh, either converted to energy or they actually might be used, recompressed and used as particle board, other things. Every, every part of it is used. And in the pulp mill, pure cellulose is extracted from the wood. The rest of the tree, the, what's called hemicellulose, the lignin and any other component, is actually used to either power the process and sometimes even to generate excess power from a mill. So a mill sort of consumes all of it, its needs from the, uh, the biomass and then maybe exports uh, electrical power as well. And high yield, sustainable forestry practices are actually expanding the amount of uh, total biomass that you can get per unit area from uh, uh, the, the, the forest complex that you use. And this is in South America and in China, there are extensive programs for afforestation, creating new forests where there, where there weren't before, again, to produce this valuable resource for using it in a whole host of uh, applications. I just want to touch on this other half, the, uh, what looks like orange here in this, 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 this uh, PowerPoint, uh, which, called, uh, which is the fuel side. Now, that's not uh, biofuels or, or any of, of that sort of fuel. What that is is actually uh, half of the to that total uh, wood harvest is actually harvested in the less developed parts of the world, and that's used for making uh, cooking charcoal and for home heating. It's harvested in a very not unsustainable way, and uh, it's sort of a very inefficient use of a very valuable resource, and that really represents a low-hanging fruit for making a significant difference in total CO2 emissions and carbon sequestration in the world. So I really try to illustrate here that forests already provide a scale resource. It's comparable to the uh, volume of oil that's pulled out of the ground. And it's globally expandable by increasing high yield forest practices around the world. So then how do we actually harness this for, uh, to be a part of the secure energy solution? Well, I've sort of been talking about wood but now I want to look a bit beyond wood. And uh, uh, we've been exploring how to create a new paradigm for uh, forestry. And I'll touch on why this is particularly important uh, a little later. Uh, you may be familiar with how we manage forests in the uh, Pacific Northwest, which are sort of landscapes uh, planted with uh, uh, Douglas fir. And on the, the illustration on the left there is the sort of uh, forest you have across the, across the hillsides here in the northwest. And 
but we also manage major plantations in the southeast of the, of the US. And uh, I'm showing that on the bottom here. And in the so southern states, the land is very flat. We plant timber with uh, large uh, spaces between the rows because that allows us to get the best quality uh, timber. And in actual fact, there's, there's significant land which is in the rows between the trees, which is available to produce another crop, which, which we believe could be an energy crop. So if you look at the potential of putting an energy crop on existing forest lands, and in, particularly in the, in the southern states, you find that this could indeed become a major new scale resource which can be turned for energy purposes. That's still growing high value timber and then adding another crop, an energy crop, into that land. The picture on the bottom I pointed out here actually shows loblolly pine, which is used as a southern pine for uh, timber and some, some for pulp. And it shows switchgrass, which is a native of the uh, region. You can grow switchgrass between the rows of trees, and therefore you get switchgrass and high-value timber on the same land. And we're actively exploring the potential for scale, sustainable energy crop production now on such, such lands. Now, while we're working on the forestry side to generate high-yield energy crops, we've also got to actively work on understanding the impact on soil, water, ecosystem, and of course carbon capture of the new crops and planting schemes. Because as I said at the beginning, any solution that you put together to create biofuels has got to be truly sustainable at, at the end. So let's just talk about the next step in biofuel production. Converting the biomass built up by solar energy, so you go from the sun through the photosynthesis to sugars, from sugars get linked together to make cellulose, to make biomass. If you now want to make a biofuel, you've got to unlock all of the energy in those sugars and other compounds, and then find a way to convert them into a uh, liquid biofuel. So in a sense, you're going from sun to intermediate and then back from the intermediate to a uh, biofuel, so you're sort of powering your vehicle with uh, solar energy that's, that's been transmitted to it through the biofuel. But first I wanted to touch on uh, looking at the biomass more closely before we just go into how do you process it, from a sort of macro down to a molecular level. Now the major component of a plant is the stem and the support structure. And I represent here, which I've represented here by a tree, but of course it could be, the same applies to shrubs, grasses, and, and, and other, other matter. And first, look at the, there's the major structure that is the trunk of the, tr trunk of the tree here. It's made up of the uh, uh, cellulose structures, which if you look closer, you see the wood is actually comprised of cells. It's little cells with uh, open air structure. It makes it very strong and light. That's why wood is such a good structural material. And then those cells actually are made up of fibers. They're made up of uh, cellulose fibers, which uh, uh, will be familiar to everyone as the fibers in paper or in, the, uh, in diapers and tissue. And then those fibers, in turn, are made up of microfibrils, which are actually chains of cellulose uh, polymer chains, which are these sugars just joined end-to-end -end chemically to make long chains, which are then bound up. So the whole tree is that sort of fractal going from large structure to uh, uh, nanostructure there. And the cellulose and fibers and the, the cells are actually all held together by the lignin I talked about, the glue, is actually fixes all this stuff together to make the whole structure to be very rigid and uh, stable. And indeed, there's also mixed up in that some other, other sugars and things called hemicellulose, which eventually make the whole structure. So typical biomass is composed of the fibers of cellulose, which is 40 to 50 percent, sugars, 15 to 25 percent, and then held together by lignin, which makes another 15 or 30 percent. Now, this is the material that we already use, and we've, we've seen how we use the macro properties in structural elements in homes and uh, paper and cardboard and adsorbents. What's yet to really be developed is how do you unlock the materials within that uh, uh, lignocellulose mass to be able to replace a part of the petroleum stream 
for transportation use. And this is not a new idea. There's been a lot of people working on this for a long time. But it's in the new economic and public policy environment that there have become compelling drivers to actually protect and develop the forest complex that I talked about to actually get to sustainable fuel use. So how do we take a biomass and transform it into fuel and feedstocks? Well, at the high level, we simply grow biomass, which in principle can be anything from a forest resource, agricultural waste, crops, that sort of thing, and then convert it, as Dan pointed out, through heat or chemistry or biological action into some new usable product. We actually have a great starting point already in the, the fact that we have a, the forest products industry already has the skills to plant, grow, and harvest massive quantities of biomass. And for example, a pulp mill today probably transforms maybe a million tons a year of biomass. And it does that in a, through a complex set of processes that end up with a sort of consistent, reliable product at the end, recycles all of the intermediates and any other infeeds that are used in the pulp mill. So it's possible already to process million ton quantities a year in a single mill of uh, biomass. So when you think about, is it possible to take biomass and go through chemical transformations to make a, a liquid transportation fuel, for example, then there's already a lot of the um, competence in handling and uh, transforming to do this. So if you look at that, then the next step to go to how do we actually make biofuels, it's sort of the next step is really getting the chemistry and chemical engineering right, and you should be able to do this. So we've got a lot of the things in place. And th but the challenge of doing that is the one that Dan laid out, which is making fuels from biomass took originally maybe uh, millions of years of heat and pressure. The challenge is how do we actually do that in hours or minutes rather than uh, millions of years? And how do we make the conversion happen at a sufficiently low cost that it actually makes it economically attractive to do? And that, that is the big challenge. So I just want to look at a couple of the, the ways to do that. Uh, first, as Dan mentioned, the biochemical route. This is the low temperature. This is using nature's way to uh, 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 transform the, the lignocellulose. And really what this, if you think of what I said, Cellulose is a chain of sugar molecules. And in the biochemical route, what you're doing is simply looking at a way to unzip the chains to make sugars. And you can unzip the chains actually with uh, acid. You can do that with uh, inorganic acids. Uh, that tends to have a low yield, and it gets difficult to handle all the recycled materials. Or you can do it more elegantly with enzymes. Now. Cellulose is not actually very easily broken down to sugars. It's called, it's re, it's called refractory in, in that sense. And if it was, then trees would dissolve in the rain and uh, cows wouldn't need multiple stomachs to digest grass. I mean, it's, it's tough to do. But there are natural enzymes that can do it. As you can see, cows can break down cellulose with enzymes in, in their gut and Termites can do it, and many fungi can do it. So there's, there's ways around there in nature to uh, break down the cellulose. So you can get enzymes, but once you have the sugars now, it's a relatively small step to take those sugars and ferment them and think of making beer and wine. You can ferment things to make ethanol. So now you've gone from cellulose to ethanol, and that's uh, uh, cellulosic ethanol. But there are still big hurdles in that. How do you make the enzyme fast and cheap enough? How do you get the, the right energy balance so that you can distill the alcohol out of the water to get uh, a high octane uh, uh, ethanol? And actually, the step one here, which is the uh, one like in the cookbook of uh, if you want to make uh, your Christmas turkey is first catch the turkey. This one here is pre-treatment. You've got to take a biomass, you've got to chew it up, you've got to get it in, a, in prepared form such that you can do that Hydro, what's called hydrolysis, breaking down the cellulose into sugars. These are all big challenges. And uh, we're actually, there's work around the world going at solving all of the uh, steps in, in these challenges. These are big challenges, but there's, there's a lot of work going on, on on them. And there's small demonstration plants springing up around the, the US to show 
pieces of the puzzle being uh, solved here. But I've talked about, really, how do you get cellulosic ethanol here, but let, let me just address, use this as a moment to address some of the fundamental issues of uh, producing biofuels from uh, cellulose. And I think everybody here was probably heard about the uh, food for fuel controversy and the challenges to sustainability of corn ethanol. Uh, and actually the DOE, who's a big funding source for producing corn ethanol and then for the, the downstream technologies, has been very clear that they saw corn ethanol as a bridging technology. It put some infrastructure in place. It taught us a lot of things about how to do a bi biomass processing. But they also saw that the end game was uh, cellulosic uh, ethanol. This, this would be the, the real uh, goal of the, of the program. So corn ethanol is seen as a, as a transition. And, and this slide illustrates one of the reasons why that, that is a, uh, a correct view, if you like, of that, that, uh, uh, that program. Because what I'm showing here is the ratio of the, in effect, the amount of equivalent uh, liquid fuel that you can get out of a given source if you put in one gallon of uh, liquid fuel to, to do the processing. So if you take electricity, that means if you take the equivalent of a gallon of uh, fuel, make power, transmit it, and then use it, in actual fact, you're getting about half of it back because of the generation losses, the transmission losses, and then the, the use losses. If you take gasoline, then to deliver gasoline to, to your, your automobile, to your fuel tank, it takes more than a gallon of gasoline to get it there. You, you have to take a ga gallon out, you have to use some more, so you get a, a factor of about 0.8. Uh, when you look at corn ethanol, there is actually a gain. If you take, uh, the, look, look at the amount of energy required to generate corn ethanol in terms of fossil fuels, then you do need a significant amount of energy to plow the fields, to fertilize, to harvest, and to get, move things around. But in the end, you do actually get a gain of about, it's somewhere around 1.3. There's, there's argument about exactly what that is. So it's a small gain. So it's not a huge solution in terms of solving uh, where do you get uh, new liquid transportation fuels, but it, but it is a gain. If you look at what you can get if you solve the problems around uh, uh, cellulosic ethanol, then the gain becomes 10 to 1 because you're, you're dealing with a, a much bigger fraction of the biomass you've grown. You're being much more efficient in how you use the solar energy and the land to get that mass, and therefore you can now get a much higher uh, return per unit of fossil fuel you put in. So 10 to 1 is now meaning that you really are making a significant difference in the whole uh, supply chain of, of that energy. And when you use the cellulosic ethanol, particularly in the way I, I highlighted, if you start to use uh, um, plantation forest lands to grow the cellulosic material that you're going to transform, you now not only avoid the food for fuel debate, but you avoid the other thing that's arising, is where it's argued that if you use agricultural land to grow uh, a fuel, then somewhere in the world, someone is going to cut down forest to create agricultural land to be able to be fed because in the end food is going to come first in the world. So if that logic really does play out, then it turns out that although you get a small gain in with uh, cellulosic ethanol, you get a huge loss with the unintended consequence of cutting down forests somewhere to grow some more, more fuel because now you have a huge negative CO2 imbalance with, with doing that. So I'll just touch on one more way of uh, uh, potentially converting biomass into uh, a, a liquid fuel. And this one is uh, called gasification. And in gasification, what you're doing is you're partially burning biomass in the presence of additional water to make carbon monoxide and hydrogen. That's called syngas. And think of how uh, a gas stove or a uh, gas heater can produce carbon monoxide when it's poorly ventilated. Well, what you're doing here is you're sort of burning biomass in a poorly ventilated state, which creates carbon monoxide. You've got water in there, which also creates uh, hydrogen. So you make this syngas, this uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And 
So you're deliberately burning in limited ventilation, and then you capture the carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Now, once you have this syngas, it's proven technology to take syngas, pass it over a catalyst, and you can convert that to, for example, a, a, directly to a low sulfur diesel. And you can actually make a whole host of compounds once you, once you have syngas. Uh, South Africa generated its gasoline by this process from coal, using coal and gasifying coal and going through that process during the period of the oil embargo. It's, it's a, it's a well-proven uh, process. And gasification has the advantage that because you're, if you like, you're partially burning the biomass, you don't have to do lots of uh, preparing it for enzymes or bugs to eat it. You can take it more or less raw and uh, almost anything can be burned. So almost anything can be, uh, that can be burned can be gasified. Now, there's challenges with this. It so sounds great, and actually there's some uh, uh, significant large-scale pilots that will start up a uh, company in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the south of the, the US will be starting one up in about 2010. It'll come on stream. It's possible to do, but there are some big challenges when you really get to getting to scale and uh, viability long term because what happens is that to make this at the full, at good eco economical uh, um, output, you have to have very large scale. And when you have very large scale to get capital efficiency, you then means you have to pull in biomass from a very large area and you start to run into challenges of logistics and transportation of biomass to this, this huge plant that's going to make, uh, would, would make uh, uh, biodiesel or, or fuel. So there's challenges there. The other challenge is that you're actually, it's inefficient in terms of the biomass because you throw away a significant amount in, as uh, carbon dioxide as you're doing that partial burning. So nevertheless, as I said, there will be some plants using the technology uh, which will come on stream probably about in 2010. And these will be demonstrations. These are partly funded by the DOE, but it, it's starting to prove, prove some of the technology. So there are still major technology challenges. And uh, I mentioned at the start that there was also a, a challenge of infrastructure, getting the whole infrastructure, end-to-end -end infrastructure. So how can we even conceive of putting together this whole seed to fuel tank uh, in infrastructure? Well, we mentioned that there's business, business issues as well as uh, technical issues. And uh, to, to help us do this, and enable a complete solution, Chevron and Weyerhaeuser have formed a joint venture partnership, and it's called Catch Light Energy. And this partnership is to explore the path forward to put in place the whole infrastructure to convert scale, sustainable biomass from non-food pathways into clean, secure transportation fuels. Now, this partnership brings together a company warehouser that has a scale biomass potential, the knowledge on processing biomass at scale, and with the company that understands chemical processing, that understands fuels and fuel blending, and has the infrastructure and assets to take a fuel and actually deliver it to tanks. So when you put that whole, the two companies together, you start to envisage you've got an end-to-end -end solution that can actually has all of the components in place to, to make this happen. With Catchlight there, to, really with the challenging problem of dealing with the, some of these challenges that I've uh, highlighted today. And so there are still many process options and combinations of processes being considered. And there's a need for a host of technical solutions that cover all manner of process, of logistics, of engineering hurdles. There's things as simple as uh, if you're going to gather biomass in a different way in, in a forest, what sort of equipment can you use? What, how, do you, how are you going to transport it effectively? What are the, what are the, what are the lengths to which you, you need to go to? Uh, what, how far are you allowed to transport materials? There's all of these have to be uh, uh, worked through, as well as the issues I'm, I, I highlighted on uh, demonstrating true, true sustainability. So, just to summarize, I think, I'd like to think that we've seen that biomass can be part of a scale solution 
to liquid transportation fuels, and indeed it has some other op op opportunities in some other energy sources and material sources. And it can be a, a contribution to the production of clean, sustainable liquid transportation fuels. Now there's still a whole set of challenges, and we're working on somewhere in the world, someone is working on all of these, and it's our goal to be a synthesizer and bring the solutions from uh, all of these uh, uh, solutions from, from around the world to make this happen. And as you saw, we need a combination of science, engineering, manufacturing, and business skills to, to make this actually happen. And I'll just return and add something to uh, Dan's closing slide, because we believe that the solutions are going to emerge from a wide range of sources. This could be from academia, from government labs, venture companies, large companies, uh, a whole set of uh, possible uh, uh, providers of the solutions to this problem. And the time scale to full-scale realization is such that to Dan's point, we do need, in the center part that Dan talked about, we do need to be developing the base science and the human talent that can come out and help solve these problems. And that's one of the roles that a, a university can play. And I think Dan spoke to that, that uh, very well. At the same time, we need this whole ecology of companies, government agencies, venture investment, and actually we need nature as well to realize the potential there is here to, to bring forward a solution. And if you think about it, that the prizes are big. The prizes are huge in this case to uh, uh, come up with solutions, and incentives both economic and social are also huge, but it's going to be through very broad collaboration that this particular piece of the energy future will be brought into being. But if we're successful, the world will have another tool in a, the sustainability toolbox to provide safe, secure, clean energy to support an increasing global quality of life. And thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs>